Yesterday we talked about the 10 biggest mistakes uh, that you can make as an investor when you buy foreclosures, part one. Uh, we did the first five things. Today is the, the follow-up five. These are the second group of the five worst things that you can do, the biggest mistakes you can make as a real estate investor when you're buying foreclosed properties. We're gonna start right off now with number one, which is not understanding, if you're buying a foreclosure, not understanding if the state in which you're buying foreclosures is a judicial or a non-judicial state. Now, let me explain the differences. Uh, judicial foreclosures happen in probably half the states and they require the use of a judge. A judge will come in and make a decision. Uh, they'll have to sign off on a foreclosure. It has to go through court. Uh, it's not an automatic procedure. There's some uh, positive things that a homeowner can do to avoid or to stay bankruptcy. I mean, uh, foreclosure, one of them is bankruptcy, and there's some other things you can do, but the bottom line is it's a court action or a judicial action. It is not what's called a non-judicial. Now, the other side of the coin is the other half of the states that do what's called a non-judicial foreclosure. Non-judicial foreclosures uh, through the mortgage instrument, either the mortgage or the deed of trust, it automatically includes the option at the right of the lender to just go in and by virtue of service, Service sometimes in some states is defined as mailing something to somebody certified. Uh, in a lot of states, it requires that a process server uh, delivers a document, but the document doesn't have to go through the courts. It's just the lender turns over their beneficiary or their trustee responsibilities to a third party, uh, generally called a foreclosure trustee. And that person or that company will send out a document that says you're now in default and here's the timelines involved. You have, and then it tells the rights that the, the borrower would have and it gives the rights to remedy. So in other words, it says, listen, if you don't pay this amount of money by this date, we have the right to take the next step in the foreclosure process, which is uh, in most dates, it's an auction. And then the auction uh, turns into, you've, you've all seen these things and heard about these, public auction, courthouse steps, we're selling your house, that kind of thing. But there's this period of time where all of this starts and the whole process is done without benefit of a judge's signature or going to uh, a judge to have anything signed off. It's an automatic procedure. It's built in to your original borrowing document and it, it prescribes or ascribes the process uh, individually for what's gonna happen should you fall behind or do something else that will call the lender, will make the lender call due that particular loan. So you need to be aware of whether you've got a judicial or non-judicial foreclosure going on because you have to act differently as an investor accordingly. So let me give you an example. California here, I'm a resident of California, lifelong, um, has a non-judicial, actually you can do judicial, but it's primarily, it's prescribed by law statutorily to be a non-judicial state. So the way it works in California is the minute the bank decides they're gonna call your loan due, they send this document through the trustee, the foreclosure trustee, and you get 90 days to catch your payment up. At that point, within 90 days, now let's say you owed 300,000 on the loan, but you're behind 20. So it will tell you, you have to pay this 20 by this 90th day, and it'll have a calculation for daily interest and all that kind of stuff. Or it'll say, call this number, and we'll tell you what you owe, and you have to pay it by that 90th day. On the 91st day, they have the right, the bank through their foreclosure uh, trustee, they have a right to file what's called a notice of trustee sale. The first one's called a notice of default. The 91st day says this is a notice of trustee sale. That means in basically 26 days from that date, uh, or 25 days, I guess it would be, uh, they have the right to go to the courthouse steps and to sell your house out from under you. So during that period of time, for the first 21, uh, it's, it is 26 days, for the first 21 of the 26 day period, you still have the right to catch up your payment with just what's owed, what's, what's behind in payments. At the last five days, at the option of the bank, they have the right to call the entire loan due or just the amount that you're behind. So that 300,000 loan that was 220,000 or 20,000 behind, they can that last five days say you all you owe the whole 320,000 because now you have 
deferred interest, that kind of thing. Or they can just say, just pay us the 20 up to the day of auction and you know we'll reinstate your loan. So if you don't know what you got, you got a problem. So there's some states that have what's called a rocket docket, Georgia and Texas. And what happens there is everything is judicial and the judge signs everything in bulk. So if you go into default in December, uh, they sign everything and they mail it out to you. And on the first Tuesday of the next month, every, uh, every month, the first Tuesday, all houses in the state of Texas get auctioned off. So it's called Rocket Docket because it has, it, it's very, very quick, happens very fast. So that's the other end of the scale. California is relatively slow, but not the slowest at making this process happen. Georgia and Texas. Uh, are very fast at completing this thing. So you gotta find out whether you're judicial or non-judicial because they have different remedy ways. And you gotta find out also the, the amount of time involved. And that's the, that's the second biggest mistake is people don't know the timeline for that particular state. California is a total of 126 days. Uh, Texas is basically 30 days or less. Could be slightly more than 30 days, but only like 31 or 32 or 33 days type thing very, very fast. And once again, if you don't know the timeline, you're not going to know how to remedy this thing. So you've got to be able to know how it works. And then you've got to know the timeline. The third thing you need to find out is redemption period. And the third biggest mistake is investors will buy a property from a seller in default and, or they'll end up buying something at auction. And then they find out that that state statutorily allows that borrower to give them a year, sometimes two years, to go back and basically rebuy that home. They have the opportunity and the option by just paying what was put out on their behalf to you know, reclaim or it's called redeem. They have the ability to redeem their home. So I've seen a lot of investors make the mistake of not knowing these top three things they go buy a home in auction that's worth 500, they pay 300 for it at auction, and they go out and start doing the work on it, and they get this thing fully rehabbed, uh, and it takes you know three, four, five, six months, and then at the ninth or 10th month, the seller comes back and says, ah, I won the lottery, I'm gonna go pay that loan off now. And they have the right, they have the legal precedence and right to resell it. Also, if you don't know the redemption period and you're still in it, you're not gonna be able to get the right to sell it because you're not gonna be able to get title insurance. Your buyer won't be able to buy it because the title company will say, we're not gonna insure this transaction because the old owner has the right for 18 months or whatever to reclaim that property via the redemption clause encompassed in the state statutes. So that's a really dangerous thing. <clears throat> Most states don't have redemption, but a lot of states do. So you need to find that out. Fourth thing, uh, and, and now we're getting down to the, the wire here. These are things that are very important and very dangerous. Uh, number four is what's called equity skimming. Uh, equity skimming happens, and not all states have it, but now several do. California, of course, once again, we come up with all the interesting, unusual laws uh, out here in the land of fruits and nuts and then they get passed back east. So it starts out here, it goes back east. So we have what's called an equity skimming law in California that says if you take unconscionable advantage, that's the legal term, of the seller who's in default, in foreclosure, you can literally end up in jail. It can be a criminal charge if you do that. So let's say for example, um, there's a house that there's 200,000 owed on and it's worth seven or $800,000 and you buy that directly from, that's, this is not an auction, this is if you buy directly from the homeowner. But you buy it from the homeowner and you say, listen, I'll just take over those $200,000 payments and you know, don't worry about it, I'll give you a thousand bucks to move or something like that. You, California can, uh, the, the, through their district attorneys, the attorney general of the state of California, they can file cr up to criminal charges against you for taking advantage or unconscionable advantage by skimming the equity from that seller. Now the seller had to do it, they were gonna lose the house. Nonetheless, California says you took advantage of it. So the way that you beat, because what you did is you took and skimmed the whole probably $600,000 of equity from that seller and the seller got nothing out of it. The seller was in a bad position, they were behind on payments, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff and they couldn't come up with the payments, you happen to be there uh, and you took unconscionable advantage of them. The, the, the general safe way to go 
is you would split the equity. And so I've done a number of these deals where there was a large chunk of equity. And I said, you know, listen, uh, Mr. Jones, there's $500,000 of equity uh, right now, but it needs $100,000 of work and it's gonna take me six months. So there may be $150,000 of cost. And with 500,000 equity, excess equity, in there. Uh, by the time I get done, that 500 will drop to let's say 300. So whatever the number I get when I sell it, I'll give you half. I'll keep half, you get half. That is considered a, basically an absolute remedy from getting charged or against being charged by the state and the counties for unconscionable advantage. And trust me, there are people in California who sit in prison today because they got million dollar deals from somebody who was desperate. It was legal at the time they did it, but here in California we have, uh, for whatever reason, we have the ability to change the laws retroactive. So you've got to be careful and you've got to know if your state has an equity skimming rule. That's uh, number nine of the most biggest mistakes or most dangerous things that you can do when buying a foreclosure. The number 10 one, and this is one that uh, people fall into this trap all the time. It's called rent skimming. So rent skimming is a situation where you buy a property from somebody and let's say that you catch up the, the money that they were owed to the bank. Let's say you, somebody had a house, a couple hundred thousand dollars, didn't have a ton of equity, maybe had a hundred thousand, you're still safe because you got to do work on it. Um, but they were behind 10,000. You make that $10,000 payment to, let's just use Wells Fargo as an example. You catch the $10,000 payments up and then part of your responsibility when you buy a house like that, subject to, is you're supposed to continue to make the, let's say, $800 a month payments. So if all of a sudden you buy it, catch it up, and you rent it out, and now you're getting income in, let's say you just want it as a rental, and that's a great way to buy rentals, but you've got you know $1,200 a month coming in and you're not paying Wells Fargo. You stop making payments to Wells Fargo. You have two of those at any one point in time, and that is a felony charge in the state of California. Once again, criminal charge. That's called rent skimming. So if you buy something and the, the, the concept, when you buy a subject to, you are telling these people, I'm gonna catch it up and I'm gonna make payments going forward. So down the road, your credit, which is horrible now because you're in default, will become better and it'll, eventually it'll go back to where it was. If you take money for that property and then you don't pay the underlying lender, even though the underlying lender can, in theory, call the loan due, but if you don't make that payment and you're getting payments in, that's rent skimming. So you do two instances of that and it goes from a potential misdemeanor up to a felony. It is not something you wanna spend time in San Quentin for. So not that I've done that, I haven't done that, but I was warned early on by my advisors, don't ever do that. There are guys in California, once again, uh, who have done big rent skimming things and their excuse was, you know, I, I had other expenses I had to cover. It was legit. You know, my, my kids needed glasses and my wife needed shoes or whatever. And so I used the money, the excess money, and I wasn't paying the underlying loan. And, you know, here they sit in prison for that. So that the nine and 10, those are ones that you don't just walk away from. You've got to be very, very careful to uh, keep the promises you make and be sure to don't make promises that you can't keep. So if you're going to get involved in this business, you need to write it through the good and the, bad, and the bad, and you can make a lot of money on it, but you better do what you say you're gonna do, which is to continue to make those payments. Don't rob people of their equity. If they have a huge amount of equity, be fair about this, be conscionable about it, and give them a piece or buy it out or give them a bunch of cash up front, but don't skim huge dollars of cash from them or of equity from them, and then just say, too bad, you were motivated and you were desperate, and because in, in front of a jury, it will be like this greedy guy took, stole, and they're allowed to say that. They stole the home from this person, uh, didn't give them hardly anything for it, and cashed a $427,000 check when they were done. That's not going to be good optics in front of a jury. Don't do that. All right? That's your 10 biggest mistakes. Hopefully, you don't make any of them. Uh, if you need any uh, help with that stuff, of course, always DM us. And uh, we'll be glad to give you our two cents worth. Thanks a lot, everybody. That's our news you can use for today. Okay, thank you for watching. If you get a minute, I would love to hear your comments about what you think of these videos. Feel free also to put in any topics down here in the comment section of things that you'd like to hear me discuss. Any questions you want, go ahead and put in here. We'll make sure we get a video on it when we get time. And as always, please like and subscribe. Hit that ring the bell button as well to get notified every time there is a new video. Thanks a lot, everybody.